All right, so we've been in this series for a while. We were going to wrap this up on Palm Sunday. If you want to go ahead and flip with me, if you have a Bible or a Bible device, uh, go to Matthew chapter 7. That's where we're going to start. Um, we're going to look at, at several different scriptures as we go today. But I wanted to um, start with this quote. Prayer enlarges the heart until it is capable of containing God's gift of himself. That's a quote from Mother Teresa. Prayer enlarges the heart until it is capable of containing God's gift of himself. We're going to talk today about enlarging prayer. Now, you could look at that two different ways. Maybe for some of us, we're enlarging or expanding our definition of what prayer is. Maybe we're taking it in, in a broader direction. But the main focus is that in prayer, we as God's children can be enlarged or expanded. In other words, in the context of this relationship, our life of worship and prayer can grow. And that's what we're going to focus on today. So let's go ahead and go to Matthew chapter 7. We're going to start in verse 7. And in my, this, I'm reading from New Living Translation today. This says, effective prayer. I don't know about you, but if we're going to pray, we probably want it to be effective, right? All right, so 7-7 seven, seven says, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be open. I don't know about you, but I think I could safely say I'm capable of asking, seeking, and knocking, right? Like that's within my, my realm of possibilities. That's probably within my capabilities. And the promise here is that keep on keeping on, if you will, and there will be an answer. Now, when I think about this, let's be honest. Do we sometimes come and ask for something and not see an immediate answer and make the assumption, well, he must not be doing that and go off in another direction or, or just sort of leave it? Do we sometimes seek the reality of something and we don't quickly find it and we so easily just give up and stop seeking? Do we knock on a door that we think is opportunity, and when it doesn't swing open on the first time, we think, well, that must not be God's will. This passage is encouraging us, keep on. Now, you might think, as I'm beginning to paint this picture, that, that the focus of this is just on persistence. It's not. Now, our good friend Gina Olson gave a, a great message a few months ago on persistence in prayer. And, and there's a reality to that. But the, the picture that we're painting today is a little different than just put your nose to the grindstone and, and, and keep going, right? The reality is that asking, seeking, knocking, this, this is a rhythm. This is a pattern. We could look at some other passages, and we will in a little bit, where Jesus has other rhythms of calling and sending. Sowing and reaping are calling to bring God's reality into the world. Our relationship with God grows or enlarges or expands. As that happens, our life of worship and prayer also enlarges. And so this is part of what I think he's saying is that when he tells us to keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking, it's not just because, you know, well, we've got to knock three times before he answers. It's in the process of continuing to seek what we're after and doing that in relationship with him, led by the Holy Spirit, we change. We, our, our life of worship and prayer expands. Somehow in that process, sometimes our ability to have faith in what we're asking for increases. Because every time we encounter him in relationship, 
it, it has an effect. It changes us. The door will be open. I, I want to talk to you about this in a little bit different way for just a second. How many of you are, are familiar with this, the sort of a concept of holding something with an open hand? I don't know about you, but I have a lot of promises in my life, things that I am confident God has spoken to me, He has told me will come to pass, things that, that I, I just, I know that I know that I know that He has said these things and I trust that His word is true. And I have to hold these things with an open hand. If I hold it with a closed hand, that's, that's probably not going to work out real well. But holding things with an open hand means even when I don't see obvious movement towards the thing that God has promised me, I'm now notice, it's open. It's not letting go. I'm not saying, oh, you know, I, I give up on this. There's a reality to, I'm open, God. I'm open to how you want to get there. Because oftentimes when God gives you a, a vision or a calling or a promise, it's really easy for us to, to take that, and I'm, I'm illustrating things that are not tangible here, but it's like, here's this promise from God. Thanks, God, I got it, and now I'm going. And we leave the relationship. We think, oh, this is so fun, this is so exciting, this is, I've been asking for this, I've got it, let's go. The reality of the things that God promises you, calls you to, and gives you a vision for are often totally independent of the timing of walking into those realities. And so I need to be willing to hold things with an open hand, to continue believing, asking, seeking, knocking, trying my best to move with God in relationship towards that reality while accepting I may encounter any number of things on that path to get to that reality. And I may take a path that is very not linear. It, 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 it may take me all different kinds of places, and it may at times feel like I'm actually going the exact opposite direction of what I think God has placed before me. But if I'm holding it with an open hand, I'm saying, God, I still believe that you have this for me, but I also still trust that you are with me right now in the journey, and I'm going to keep asking. See, God's not insulted by the persistence, right? He's not insulted that you keep, because that's part of us stirring up our, our faith. Saying, God, I, I, I'm, I'm going to keep believing. I'm going to keep asking. I'm going to keep seeking. Now, the key is we also do that with open ears. We do that with open ears because he's often going to nudge us or whisper or lead us to, towards things that, again, it's like, well, how does that line up with where I think I'm going? It might not. But in relationship, he's teaching us to trust him. He's transforming us to be more like him, and so I need to keep asking. I need to keep seeking. I need to keep knocking. Now, this is a little bit of a, a sub-point before we move on. But developing our relationship with God and allowing that to enlarge and transform our life of worship and prayer, we also need to develop relationships with people who don't know Jesus the way that you do. Not saying they maybe don't know him at all, especially in our culture. Most people recognize you know, that God exists. Now, I'm not saying everybody, but most of the people in your spheres of influence probably have some concept, but maybe they don't know him the way that you do. Maybe they don't know him in this intimate, relational way where you have permission to keep asking, seeking, and knocking, where you, you journey with him, led by the Spirit. Maybe they don't. And so we need to develop relationships with people Oftentimes, the things that we're seeking are found in the context of going where God's going and doing the things that he's doing. Now, that, that's a whole other thing that we'll talk about some other time. But I'm just trying to connect this because it might seem like when we're talking about this one thing and then we're talking about having relationships, they're very interconnected. 
the reality of becoming who Jesus has called us to be and walking out our walk, seeking, asking, and knocking for the things that Jesus has for us is often discovered in the process of doing the things that Jesus did, of having relationships with people who don't know him like we do. We often are transformed or discipled by Jesus in the process of giving away that to others of living life in a way that we care for people, that we pray for them to know God more. One of the best ways for you to know God more is to be praying and blessing other people and encouraging them to know God more, to care about the needs of their lives and to do something about it within the realm of your capabilities. Pray for their needs, meet them when possible, and be generous. These are, these are practices that should be regular parts of living a Christian life. As because the whole purpose of Jesus' mission and ministry and life was reconciling people to himself. And let us not be so selfish as to think, well, I'm on the list now, so I'm good. I can sit back and relax until he comes and gets me you will live a very incomplete Christian life. You will, and this is, this is the paradox, right? You have no idea how many, now I don't think anybody here is probably trying to sign up for that, but I'm just trying to illustrate. You will miss an untold number of blessings and life-transforming realities if you're not willing, in whatever way you're wired. I'm not saying that everyone needs to become a street evangelist. Or, or what, you know, whatever picture pops into your mind when you think of evangelizing. Naturally supernatural. I'm, I'm, I got to go ahead and plug this now. I'm really excited. Uh, we're going to be working through some of this as a leadership team over the summer. But this fall, we're going to do a church-wide campaign called Bless. And the whole idea of Bless is that we're going to give ourselves a framework for how to do evangelism without doing evangelism. To do it in the places you already are. And it's simply bless. Begin with prayer. Listen. Eat. Serve. And share your story. These are like basic, a basic framework for activities that we can all do. If evangelism is intimidating, these are things you can latch onto. And you can do them without having to feel like, uh, I got to go rent a soapbox and stand on the street corner. Do it where you're already at. Be supernaturally empowered to live like Jesus in the places where you're already at. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to go any more on that because that's, that's later. But these, these activities and these heart postures of caring about people, sharing your story, meeting needs, being generous, these are practices that will be part of enlarging your life of worship and prayer. We, so there's something that's so real. We can have God do something totally amazing in our life, and we thank him for it, and we praise him for it, but, it, but it's for us. When you see God do something incredibly amazing or miraculous in somebody else's life, and you've had a part in it, that is going to enlarge you and expand you more than probably anything that he could do for you personally. Because there's actual joy, and, and you actually feel the pleasure of the Lord knowing that you partnered with him to bring that type of reality to somebody else. To, if you know somebody who you would characterize as a person that doesn't seem to have much hope, and you can be part of the conduit that they can actually encounter the hope of Jesus, I, I'm just, I don't know how else to express it if you've not experienced it, and I know many of you have. There is no greater joy that, than, than being that. And, and the cool thing is, as that reality passes from God to that person through you like a conduit, you get blessed in the process. You get enlarged. Your reality of worship and prayer is expanded. What you believe is possible is expanded. And sometimes that's what it takes in order to get up the next morning and keep asking, keep seeking. I, I, I love this tension between, 
I like to start my, my times of prayer with thanksgiving, right? I like to focus towards what God has done, what, who he is, being grateful. The Bible says, enter his courts with thanksgiving and praise. So I was like, that's probably a good place to start. And part of what that does is it builds up our heart to help us enter into, and God, I'm still seeking you for this. I'm still asking you for this reality, and I thank you, and I know that you're good, and I know that you have things in place and uh, in process, and I'm grateful for all that you've done, but I'm still asking for this. I'm still seeking this reality. Okay. As we participate with God in making a difference, our life of worship and prayer enlarges also. I know I got a little ahead of myself because I've already painted this picture, but I just want to make the statement. As we participate with God in making a difference, and that goes back to what we said earlier, that's caring about people, that's praying for them, that's meeting their needs, being generous, sharing, it's all, all of those activities, right? As we do that, and we're making a difference for people, our life of worship and prayer also expands, enlarges, becomes more real. Uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 10. I don't have this one on the screen. And I'm going to summarize some of this. But Matthew chapter 10 is where Jesus sends out the 12 apostles. So Jesus called his 12 disciples together and he gave them authority to cast out evil spirits and to heal every kind of disease and illness. And then it, it lists their names. Jumping down to verse 5, Jesus sent out the 12 apostles with these instructions. Don't go to the Gentiles or the Samaritans, but only to the people of Israel, God's lost sheep. Go and announce to them that the kingdom of heaven is near. That, that's the, the crux of the message. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cure those with leprosy, cast out demons, give freely as you have received. Then let's flip on over to Luke. See, Jesus, uh, it, it, the word we could use is that he commissioned. He gave them an assignment. And he commissioned and he sent out. That's, again, that's part of this pattern that, that Jesus encounters us and then he calls us and then he commissions us or he sends us out. And I, I'm just going to pause here for a second. Some of you have calling and haven't been commissioned yet. And that's a really difficult place to be in. You have a strong sense of, I have a calling on my life, and maybe you have varying degrees of clarity about what it is, but you don't feel like you're walking in it yet. And my friends, that is simply the difference between being called and being commissioned. And it's part of what we have to hold with an open hand. Jesus gives a call. He says, you child, I've made you this way. I've gifted you with these things, and I've called you to make this specific difference in the world with the way that you're made. And we have to hold that call with an open hand as he forms us and prepares us and gets us ready to fully walk in that. I may have said this before, I don't recall, but the thing that God has called you to or the thing he wants to bless you with can become a curse if you don't have the character to uphold and walk in it yet. There's always a process of Jesus helping us Develop the character to support the weight of the glory that he wants to put on our life. And we cannot shortchange that process. We can get so excited about the call that we want to run ahead of God and say, but I'm called, I want to do it, I'm, I'm so excited, I see so much possibility. Let's not run ahead of God. Let's allow him to change us and shape us and mold us so that when the commissioning comes, we have the character to bear up under the weight because it is a weight. Like what God calls us to, if you, if you walk in your calling, if you do these things that I'm talking about, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking, there's resistance. We know this reality of the tension of the two kingdoms. And so you cannot be 
fully alive in Jesus and walking in your calling and, and destroying the works of the devil and expect that there's not going to be resistance against that. But Jesus wants to prepare us for that. He wants to develop our character and our mindset so that we can bear up under that weight. And so if you feel like you have a picture of a calling and you've not walked in it yet, just begin asking the Lord when he wants to commission you or if there's things that he still wants to do in order to be able to commission you. We're going off script here. Okay. Uh, flip to Matthew 28. We're going to go there in just a minute. I'm going to skip the Luke, the Luke thing for now. Did you know that at any given time, about 3% of our population have what I call God questions? Some level of openness or seeking or wondering about God that if someone were to show up and, and speak into that, that they might have a level of openness to receiving that. That means that for us here in our local area, um, if you can go ahead and flip to the next slide because I don't want to misquote the numbers. At any given time here in Peoria, there are 12,000 plus people who have these God questions. Just to, to paint a picture of what that looks like, the seating capacity of our Civic Center is 11,442. So that means there are enough people walking around in our community that have these God questions that are just waiting for someone who's seeking, asking, and knocking to bring truth and hope and reality to them that that pile of people could overfill the Civic Center. See, we often get this idea that like there, now I realize that's still just a, a small percentage. But the reality is, they're, they're all over the place. There is a significant number of people, and that's just people who are, who are sort of categorized in that way. Uh, I don't have time to teach on it today. There's a whole uh, scale called the Ingalls scale that basically uh, helps categorize, you know, people from going from totally antagonistic to God to, you know, being just totally ready. Like, there's a whole way of identifying where people are at on that scale of, of, of openness and being ready to accept Jesus. I don't know if we have a picture of what it would be like to reach even that small percentage. And I don't mean just us here in our community. I mean all of the, of the Jesus people in the Peoria region. Like, what, what would that look like? What would it look like if the people of God were so persistent, were so tuned into the Holy Spirit that we saw every day, in, again, naturally, wherever you are, whatever your sphere of influence was, you saw each day as a mission to find the people with the God question. Not that you have to go off your path or outside of your routine, but just that you're tuned in enough that, and you're praying every day, Jesus, would you show me the people with the God question? Would you show me the people that, that you've already begun preparing their hearts, that you've put questions in their mind that, that they're seeking answers to, and could I be that answer today? Would, Jesus loves to set you up. Okay? He does. He does, and, and, and it takes a lot of the pressure off of it. See, this is the difference, and I'm not knocking traditional evangelism methods, okay? I, I'm not knocking that or saying it's invalid, but for most of us, it's intimidating, right? To go and just, you know, cold knock doors or, or pass out tracks on the street corner, like these things are intimidating to us. They're difficult to do, but what if, daily you had encounters with people where you're already at and people that God is all now it's not always going to be the case right like we don't identify these things perfectly but what if you were just available what if you were just looking listening asking seeking and knocking for where the people with God questions are and being ready to start your day praying that God would show them to you 
being, going through your day, listening for where you might pick up on conversations here and there that might have an opportunity for, for God to come in. What, what if you just found ways to serve those people? What if you found ways to share meals, to share your story? I, I, I don't think we can fully imagine what kind of doors this would open if, and I'm saying we, right? Like this is an area I need to develop. I think the Lord is calling me to, to cultivate these types of rhythms in my life. The final point, and then we have a few more scriptures we're going to look at. Learn to know. As we learn to know what God's presence looks like, and we ask, for, ask him for more, our life of worship and prayer also enlarges. This is part of that developing process that as we set, out, uh, set about to intentionally do these things, we will better learn what does God's presence look like? Like what kinds of things am I looking for? How do I identify what God is doing? How do I see it? How do I hear it? How, how do I smell it? Now, I'm not talking about like a physical, but we, we joke sometimes, you know, something will come along and be like, oh, I don't really get what that is or what that's about, but it smells like God. Like, you can begin to be able to identify things that God is doing, see places that he's working. And this reality of this life with Jesus is the only place where the more you do it, the more you hunger and thirst for it. You, you say, how, how do I cultivate naturally wanting more of this is that you start doing it. And as you get a taste of it, you suddenly realize how good it is. And that further deepens the hunger and the thirst for more of his presence, not just in a selfish way, but in a way that your heart is for others. And yet in the process, we do experience more of him. We experience more of his reality and all the things that are part of that. So let's get practical for a minute. How do we learn what God's presence looks like and how do we ask him for more? Learn ministry prayer. Learn. Now, I'm not just talking about those folks that come up and and stand up here on the line on Sunday morning, but just learn the mindset of how do I, now, you know, we told you before, ministry prayer, if you want to use a short, simple definition, is trying to make a difference for people. It's like meeting their needs with God's resources, not with mine. Now, I mean, sometimes I, I include mine, you know, if there's a practical need and I've got a $20 bill in my pocket, I, I, I can partner with him in that way. But the basic idea is uh, to minister to someone is to uh, partner with God to meet their needs with his resources. Okay, but that's something we have to learn. We're not just naturally good at that. We naturally uh, tend to approach it different ways. We have to be looking and listening and paying attention. Learn, I don't know how else to, to, to say this, Learn, come Holy Spirit, and wait. And wait. Now, you know, now I, I have to caveat, you know, this doesn't mean that you're standing in the line at the grocery store and you, you get a word of knowledge and, you know, you're just standing there. I'm just waiting. You know, you, you might be backing the line up, right? But I'm saying, sometimes what God is doing, you just need to invite him and then you need to wait. We don't always need to rush to our first tool of what we think needs to happen. Because again, sometimes this is not linear. Sometimes, go back a couple of weeks, we often don't know what to pray. And we need to have patience and trust. And as we're waiting on the Holy Spirit, He's already working, and so we're, we're waiting to see what He's doing. Because we want to go back to the beginning of this message. You want to have effective prayer? Pray in partnership with what the Holy Spirit is praying. Don't pray your prayer and try to get him involved. Again, we said before, God can't fit into our plan. We have to fit into his. And so our job is finding out 
What are you doing? What are you saying? And how can I be a part of it? For us, the question has to be, are we living in the hope of this world and our religious practices? Or are we living in the hope that we have a big God and that he's coming into the world just like he's coming to our life? And, and you say, well, what does that look like? For God to come into the world means the people whose lives he's come into have to be willing to go. God comes into the world through us. You are God's plan to make a difference in the world. I don't know if we grasp that. You are God's plan to make a difference in the world. Now, we've talked before, God is, he really is, uh, you know, we don't have like better language yet. He's big, like bigger than big, like he's the biggest big that ever bigged. I don't, I don't know how else to say it. And he's sovereign. So it is absolutely true that someone could be uh, driving down the road, um, not around any other people, and have an encounter with God. He can meet people sovereignly, absolutely, 100%. And it happens. One of the reasons we begin with praying for people, because sometimes God touches them sovereignly. But most of the time, he gets to people through us. He uses us, not, not in a negative way, but he does stuff through us. He commissions us to be part of what he's doing. And do you know why? It's actually more fun for him because he realizes how much blessing there is in it for us. He knows before it happens. He knows how much joy and blessing is in it when he can work through us. And he, it gives him such great pleasure to see you receive that blessing that he wants to do it through you rather than just doing it sovereignly. He wants you to be part of it. He wants you to be an active participant. Uh, John 3.16 very familiar passage. This is the message translation. But this is the why. We have a loving God. This is how much God loved the world. He gave his son, his one and only son. And this is why. So that no one need be destroyed by believing in him, anyone. Can I, I want to underline it. Anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go to all of the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger and tell the world how bad it was. He came to help to put the world right again. And he is about that business, but he's inviting us to be part of it. We have a calling, and we are empowered, and we are being commissioned to partner with Jesus in setting the world right, in rescuing lost souls from darkness and places of, of no hope. As we partner with Jesus in doing that work and in learning what his stuff looks like, we will be in law. Our, our reality So often we live our lives like we are earthly people reaching out for heaven. The reality is we are heavenly people operating on the earth. I am already, in Ephesians 1 tells me, I've already received every spiritual blessing. Now, does that mean they're all operational? No, not necessarily. But our big God has the capability in any given situation. Remember we use the droplet, the, the drops of grace? He is fully capable in any situation to give me the grace I need to do what's necessary in that situation. But we need to realize that we're living from a heavenly reality towards the earth, not the other way around. We are not um, just holding on until we get there because that's kind of a selfish way to look at it, to be honest. Like my, my walk with Jesus, there's a reality to the destination of my soul. I'm, I'm not denying that, I'm not, but 
That's not what we're talking about. It's for others. Jesus blesses you to be a blessing, not so you can become fat on blessing, right? The reality of the, of the, the overflowing cup is like it's a continual thing. He wants to keep pouring in. And if you feel like your cup's a little empty, you might need to take what little bit you've got and start pouring it out. You might need to take that first little step of faith and say, Jesus, what are you doing today? How can I? And as you do that, he's just going to pour more. He's just going to pour more.